again, thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, there's nothing too big for you. Whether it's concern over um, a health issue or we have some folks um, that we know of that are facing um, stress and needs in their lives that may be emotional um, and relational or a combination of those, Lord. It may be someone who um, is grieving over the loss of another person or a pet or, or a situation that's changed um, that, that we had no control over. And yet, Lord, your word tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever, and thank you so much, Jesus, that we, we know we can, we can call on you. You're the Prince of Peace, and I pray, Lord, that you would bless with your peace in our lives and the lives of those that we just voiced together here. We didn't inform you of anything new. We didn't give you any new details, or we surely can't give you um, suggestions on what to do. But, Lord, we can ask, as a child, ask a parent, because you invite us to ask. And, Father, in your wisdom... And in your goodness, we know we can trust you and that your will can be accomplished and will be accomplished as you desire. And that's really what we need more than anything else. Lord, help us to trust and have faith in you more than our own understanding. And in your, in your wisdom, Lord, we'll, we'll see you direct our paths in that way. So thank you for that. I thank you for each person that's here, each brother and sister in Christ, each person that's in this body right now. Lord, I pray that you would draw us to you to a deep walk with you by the power of your spirit. In your words, showing us that uh, we were created to know you and to proclaim you. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So for the next few weeks, I got a little bit of brief surprise each Bible study time to kind of show you at the beginning. This is one way I want to share with you um, what, what Israel was like. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to anybody's house when they, back in the day, there used to be slide shows. You remember those carousels and they had slides and you, you go and watch somebody's vacation somewhere, and they show you all those slides, and just when you think you're finished, like, okay, that was the first carousel, let me put on the second one, and, and you kind of feel held hostage. <laughs> I don't want to do that at all with you. Um, I do want to share with you about Israel, not as, hey, this was a great vacation. These were some really cool things to see, although yeah, there are some amazing things to see. Uh, for me personally, this was different than going to see, uh, you know, New York or the Grand Canyon or Hawaii, although I love going to those places. This was meaningful to me in a different way because our Savior walked here. <laughs> our Savior died on the cross here. Our Savior rose from the dead here. Now, um, you know, standing there didn't make me more saved, and it certainly didn't, you know, make me more right before the Lord, but being there and seeing the context of where Jesus was born and lived for 33 years and died and rose again. And where the disciples were um, that, that, that began the gospel being spread to the whole world, which is why we're here today. Being in that land um, was, was fulfilling in a way that Marty Dupree says it's like having a coloring book and all of a sudden the pictures get colored in. It's, it's that kind of a sense, like, my goodness, this is... I knew it was true, but seeing it, it just, it just reaffirmed the, the, the validity and the integrity of God's Word, of the Bible, and, and the historicity of our Savior, and that He lived and walked and died and rose again on this earth so that we can know Him now and worship Him now and be with Him forever. Because one day there's new heaven and new earth that will be here according to Scripture. So here's what I'm going to do. I had a friend go with me from, from here. Sherry, Sherry couldn't go with me. I mentioned Sunday her work didn't give her a sabbatical, and she only gets this much vacation a year, and so we have grandkids. <laughs> and so she's like, I really don't want to spend every bit of it on that one trip, and then I'm, I'm limited to doing anything else the other 50 weeks of the year. Um, but that day may come when she is able to go to Israel. And I'll go ahead and answer a question before it's asked. Actually, it's been asked by some. Is First Baptist going to have a trip to Israel? We're going to send a trip to Israel. I would love for that to happen. And so one of the things, some of y'all went recently, one of the, and some of y'all been before. Uh, how many of you have been to Israel? Let me see. Okay, wow, a good, a good number of you. Um, when we have our very next staff meeting with all the, all the staff there, when Travis is back to be a part of this discussion, I would like to put on the table that we go ahead and start planning to take a group to Israel. And I'm leaning into looking into that, what, what, logistically, what does that happen? Because, I, in fact... It's so, it was such a meaningful experience. I don't want to go relive it. I do want to go and continue to grow. 
But I was, I really want to send, I would send the whole staff and say, look, let me stay here. Y'all go and just glean from this incredible opportunity. And I'm saying that to you. If you get the opportunity, um, it's, it's, it's worth it. I don't get a kickback from Israel for trying to send people there. I'm really, this is a meaningful thing, so I hope you'll be a part of that. But what you're going to see, Bob Rain knew, my, been a friend of mine here now for 28 years almost, and um, he's one of my best friends. He's at the Revolution Church in, in Garner, Cleveland area now. Um, he went with me. And so he is really good at artsy, graphic-y stuff. I mean, he's just got a brain lobe that I don't have. So he during the whole time, he'd take pictures and videos, and he put them together. And so each day there's a short little clip, day one, Israel, day two, Israel. And so I just want to show you day one and day two this morning. Each one is just a, you know, really brief. And I want you to see what you're going to see. It's not going to explain it to you on the video, but some of the things that you're going to see um, are really neat. And we can talk about it later. In fact, we will as we walk through the book of Matthew. What you see today, like Masada or something, I was, we'll, when we get to some places, I'll stop. And we will talk in depth about Masada. We'll talk in depth about King Herod. And, um, but you'll just see some bits and pieces today. One of the things you're going to see today is a wine press. All over the place there's wine presses and olive presses. And, and um, in fact, does anybody know what Gethsemane means? The Garden of Gethsemane, what Gethsemane means? Yeah, yeah <laughs> olive press, actually. <laughs> Good job. You got 50%. <laughs> Geth is, is press, Semony is olive. And so that's what that means is it was an olive press. And there is great meaning in that, which we'll talk about in the book of Matthew. Um, there's threshing floors. How about the word tell, T-E-L? Anybody know what that means? And if you went to Israel, you know that's okay too. Don. It is. That's right. It's a build up of civilizations. And when you're walking in Israel or driving to Israel, you see tails and don't even know it because they look like hills unless they've been excavated. It's like a hill. And so it's a hill that's, it's, that's made up of civilizations that have lived there before. Um, Tel Aviv? Well, that's a good question. I'm going to imagine that it has to do with the same thing. I, I don't know what Aviv means unless it's a location. Like Tel Megiddo is one at the, where we're talking about Armageddon. This is at the valley, Tel Megiddo. And there's, this is one of the biggest ones they know of. It's 20, about 25 or, 24, 25, or 26 civilizations that are built up under the hill. So this for thousands of years that these civilizations have built up. And it's covered, you know, that they excavate and they find out, wow, this we have this one time. They can tell this was one civilization and before them was this civilization, before them was this civilization. And um, so, yeah, that's what a tell is. We're going to see some of those being uncovered in some of the videos that we see. Um, about who? A mosaic. A mosaic. Yeah. And they have well, I'm not surprised because there's, it's like the, the world's biggest Easter egg hunt over there all the time. There's constant uncovering of things. Unco they'll, they'll, they're going to put a highway in. They find out, wait, wait. They start digging, wait, there's, there's a site here. Uh, you know, and so we, they had to stop building a highway and then they excavate it and find out this was a whole village at some point and there's treasures there to be found. Very historical treasures. Um, Yeah, that's right. I just looked up a and it says springtime or freshness. Springtime or freshness. Springtime or freshness. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm, yeah, that's interesting to know that they're talking about a hill of civilizations and springtime and freshness put together. I had to, yeah, that's interesting. That's, make notes through this whole thing to go back and do what Sandra just did to try to glean more so you can come and share with us. Hey, Last week somebody mentioned this, or today somebody mentioned this. Here's what I'm finding out right now. That's, a, that's always a blessing. Um, Wadi, let me give you another word, W-A-D-I. Anybody know what that is? What would you say? A dry creek or a dry riverbed. That's right. They're all over the place, and there's some main ones in Israel. In fact, people used to travel up these. They were dry riverbeds until it was rainy season. 
And then there will be waters rushing down these. That's important to know because they use these riverbeds to go from place to place. And I'm not just talking about from here across the street. I'm talking about whole trails through the valleys, you know, that are dry. They're wadis. And we're going to see, you'll see some in some of these videos. I'm not going to share everything with you about what's here. And in, in this first video, you're going to see where David fought Goliath. I'm not going to stop at anything, but I'll talk about it later. But you'll see one place where there's, there's a green valley and another valley, I mean green mountain and another mountain and the valley in between. And this is where the Philistines were on one side and the Israelites were on the other. And David battled Goliath. I guess you can call that a battle. It was over pretty quick, wasn't it? By the grace of God. Um, there's caves in there that people would hide in later in history from the time of King David, but there was people that would hide in these caves during the time they were hiding from the Romans, when the Romans were executing um, Christians at times. And so they would go live in these caves. You're going to see a really large cave today. Um, Masada is another place. You'll see a video from the top of Masada, which was a mountain fortress built by King Herod. Um, incredible. As... as um, Difficult as a person, I'm being nice here, as difficult as a, of a person that King Herod was, he also was a genius. You're going to see all through Israel, you can go to different places, and you're going to see places that he built, whether, you know, Caesarea Maritime or Maritima, or um, I mentioned um, Sunday that at Caesarea Philippi, they built a temple there to Caesar Augustus. Uh, of course, we know about what happened at the time of the birth of Christ. Um, but there's his his footprint or fingerprints are everywhere. It seems like when there's excavations that are going on, um, Herod Herod was certainly a, a brilliant man. But he's also um, some some believe you know research him a little bit. Some believe that he was schizophrenic as well. And there's a lot of issues that came out, and people were terrified of King Herod, and rightly so. And some of you, I know, you're probably itching to share more. So there's, let me stop because I don't want to get into it. But I do want to say there's you're going to see Masada here. Um, which also is a lot of history. You'll, and if you know it, you know it. If you don't, you're going to see more. There, on one side of Masada, there's a big old ramp, and that's a part of history too about what happened there between the Romans and the Jewish zealots that were holed up up there during the, um, the time the Romans were coming in and, and overtaking all the Jews um, just before 70 A.D. And then finally on that video, I know I'm giving you all this up front because I want you to know a little bit of what you're seeing. You're going to see a camel. And you're going to see some people that lived in the desert as nomads. They're called Bedouins. And this, is, this goes way back even Old Testament times. And there's some things that happened in this Bedouin community that identified um, like such as hospitality was such an incredibly, incredibly high virtue of the Bedouin, the, the nomads that lived out in the wilderness. Um, and we'll talk about that in depth. But um, you'll see some how they, um, if you remember Abraham, out in the wilderness, and there was a day that he was visited by some angels of the Lord, angels there, and, um, and the Lord, and what happened there, when you hear about the Bedouin and, and how they treat uh, visitors that come, and you read in Scripture about how Abraham treated them that came, it, it lie, you're like, oh, I understand this now. I understand why they stood outside the tent until Abraham came out. I understand that now. It didn't make sense. I just noticed it. You know, I read it, and it's like, okay, they're standing outside the tent. There's a reason they were standing outside of Abraham's tent at that time. Uh, so it's, it's pretty interesting to see. So um, with that, that's just really the quick overview I want to give you this morning, and then we're going to move into Matthew. But watch these two videos, day one, day two. Let's go to Israel just for a minute. Okay? Here we go. If it works. David and Goliath. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow. The earth will rejoice. Your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shall you 
It looks like Harry's Palace, but it's not. That's one hotel we stayed at. Probably the best one. Day one, and there's a lot of traveling in between. Day two, let's roll with that. give you one pro tip if you ever have a chance to ride a camel no, well do if you're going to you could say don't that is a tip but if you're if you're forced to which I wasn't forced to get the front seat don't get the back seat the front seat I'll just say as nicely as I can the front seat is way more comfortable than the back seat and so just take that for what it is all right that's it um, I look forward to sharing more with you, y'all. It's a blessing. I hope I hope you're actually able to experience that one day. But um, really more important than experience than that, experiencing the power and presence of God in His in His Word and by His Spirit. And so today um, we're going to begin our study of Matthew right now. And it is eleven twelve. We're going to be out today by eleven thirty. There's no way we're going to get in depth today and and what meant to be. So today is an overview, just an introduction to Matthew and an overview, and um. I'm, I'm actually need to go quickly because we're going to watch one more video that actually begins our study of Matthew. And so let me go ahead and get started. Uh, Matthew, the person, who is Matthew? Well, Matthew was a tax collector. If this, some of this is going to be Matthew or Bible 101 for you. Some of this may be the first time, and that's okay. But Matthew is a, a tax collector that was existed back in Jesus' day. He was Jewish, but he worked for the Romans. And so he was perceived by the, the Jewish people as worse than anybody else really worse than worse than dogs worse than gentiles jews thought gentiles were terrible which most of us in here are gentiles i would imagine but they thought jews and gentiles were absolutely the lowest of the earth and if you were a tax collector and you were jewish you were worse than the gentiles and matthew was one because they considered it betrayal you, the jews did you were working for the roman government taking money from us because we're we're um possessed by the romans and so you're taking money from us, and many of the tax collectors actually stole money from their own people. 
They'd say you owe four times what you really owed. If you read the story of Zacchaeus, he did the same thing, and he took money from others. And so he's not really um, the cream of the crop, so to speak. And yet he was called by Jesus, this rabbi Jesus, this teacher Jesus that came, this Messiah we know. And Matthew began to understand in his time there's something different about this teacher, this rabbi, this man of God who has come. And so in Matthew 9, 9, it's this one verse I'm going to read. It says, as Jesus went from there, he saw a man, a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. And Matthew writes in the gospel of Matthew about his own calling from the Lord. Um, and that's who Matthew was as a person, Jewish ancestry, tax collector, and then called by Jesus. Jesus didn't call him because Matthew was so knowledgeable of all things of God. He didn't call him because he had such a great ability to write, and I need you to write a gospel for me. He called him because God had a purpose and a plan for Matthew. And it wasn't just to call, it wasn't to call people based on their ability. It was based on God's providence, and he called, he called Matthew. And Matthew got up, Scripture says, and he followed him. If, you're, if you watch the series, The Chosen, um, it's very interesting after I came back from Israel to see some of the things in this series, The Chosen, that uh, really there's a lot of cultural um, information that's there that gives you a good context for what you read in Scripture. But I want to put this guard out there. Never allow what you see as a, a, a screenplay or, or The Chosen or anything Take the place of God's Word. Don't ever allow it. The chosen is not the Bible. It's based on the Bible. It's an interpretation of it. The portrayal of Jesus is based on what they, one man or a group's interpretation of what they read in Scripture. But the chosen is not the gospel. It's not the Bible. This book is the Bible. This is the Word of God. So don't ever replace those. Understand that the chosen is fiction um, based on truth. It gives great, I think, you know, understanding of what it must have been like to be a tax collector in that day, what it must have been like to be um, Peter, a fisherman in that day. But I also don't want to read Scripture through the lenses of the gospel, of Chosen or any, any bit, uh, movie or series or portrayal. But the Word of God needs to be the filter for everything else. That needs to be the filter. So when you hear me reference the Chosen, um, don't, don't ever please give more weight to that than what I mean it. Um, but it is historically, there were some things that I see in The Chosen, I thought, wow, that helps me understand the setting or the way things could have been with Peter and his, his um, family, you know, and, and his wife and things could have been that way. But this is the Word of God, and there's nothing like it. So that's Matthew. He was a tax collector. And he's an interesting character in The Chosen. But I know in here he was a tax collector. He was hated by many, and yet Jesus said, come, follow me. Now let's talk about Matthew the book. Um, Matthew, the book, was inspired by God's... Matthew, the, the person, was inspired by God's Holy Spirit to write this book. Somewhere probably around 50 or 60 A.D. This would have been about three decades after Jesus was died and buried and resurrected. About 30 years later. Which, by the way, is super close to the actual event, relatively speaking, across the time of history. And uh, he being an eyewitness, he being one that Jesus followed to write this gospel... Um, traditionally, it's understood that Matthew wrote this gospel. Um, some folks don't believe he did. I believe he did. Um, but traditionally, I, you know, I think it's accurate. Uh, why did he write it? Well, his primary concern is giving evidence that Jesus is the Messiah and his primary audience are the, is the Jewish people. That's who Matthew was really writing to, the Jewish people. Now, it's obviously good for Jews and Gentiles. It's good for the world, for all of us to know that Jesus is the Messiah. But he's writing... Uh, especially to Jewish people, that Jesus is the king that they've been waiting for for a long time because they had the Old Testament. They had the, the word of God, the scriptures from the Old Testament, the Torah, and all the prophecies from the prophets that pointed to a king that was coming. And then Matthew wrote that Jesus, he wrote after Jesus was died, buried, and resurrected, Jesus was that king. Jesus is that king that was promised all through the Old Testament. And you can see this because there's no other gospel that quotes as many Old Testament scriptures as Matthew does. He's talking to the Jewish people. The Jewish people knew the Old Testament. 
And so Matthew is saying, these, these things that you're reading and that you've grown up knowing and memorizing and proclaiming, Jesus fulfilled them. And so you'll, we're gonna, when we get through uh, Matthew, I'm excited because we have so much Old Testament to pour into as well that connects God's plan from the beginning to the end uh, right there in the book of uh, Matthew. And that's why um, next week I'm going to ask you to read chapter 1 for next week. And it begins with a genealogy. And I know, you know not, a lot of, not a lot of people get, ooh, a genealogy, I can't wait. <laughs> Woo, ancestry, yay. Because you're going to see some names there that are familiar and some that may not be familiar. But there's a reason that Matthew gives this genealogy because he's showing the Jewish people this one that Jesus is on the scene now or was on the scene, you know, within my lifetime, Matthew's saying, when he was here, he's the one through that God, through a, the, the thread of God's work through, through in this world runs through Abraham and David and even the Babylonian exile, which we've talked about uh, through Jeremiah and Daniel when we studied those books into the day that Jesus is born and died and resurrected and spoke of the kingdom that's to come. He's saying this is who Jesus is. That's why he starts with a genealogy. He's legally, uh, through the genealogy, genealogy he's legally ha he legally has claim to Messiahship because that's who he is. Um, and then not only the genealogy, but the teachings that he, he proclaimed. You will read, and you've heard this, wow, he teaches differently. He teaches like one with authority. He's not just up here teaching. There's something different about his teaching. It's as if God himself is teaching is what they're saying. He's teaching as one with authority. Well, there's a reason for that because he is God. And so we're going to see that's, that's another reason that Matthew is writing and proclaiming that Jesus is who he says he is. And he brings us to a conclusion at the end of Matthew. And if it, if it stopped a little bit short, it would be sad because this one who was the king that was to come, the promised king of the Jews, dies but it doesn't end there and Matthew doesn't end there because Jesus didn't end there his life didn't end there he died and three days later he rose again and so that Matthew gives us this um, account of, of the resurrection and then also of Jesus's commissioning the church because Matthew the book of Matthew proclaims through Jesus's teaching not just of things past or present but also things future he talks about the birth of the church he talks about the coming kingdom that we, we've read about in Revelation. There's a kingdom of God that's coming. And so Matthew, we're going to see every bit of that kind of pulled together. And Matthew is a great hinge between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the coming kingdom of God. Um, how to prepare. And I'm going to leave this with you right here. I know this is very brief, but I want you to see this video. It's about a seven-minute video, so we're going to end right on time. Um, how to prepare for this study. Read the chapter ahead of time. In fact, one of the things I found, I don't know why in the world I hadn't done this sooner, but when I had time on my sabbatical for a prayer retreat, I went to Caraway for a few days. They have a little mountain house up there, one-bedroom house, and it's called the Minister's Mountain House. And, and so I went up there and stayed there, and um, just me and God in the woods for about three days, and I read through the whole book of Matthew, and this time I read it out loud. And I read it out loud six chapters at a time so I could stop and just marinate on, on what I just read. And there's such a difference. It may have been, been alone, but the, the difference to me when I was reading out loud, I couldn't skim over words. I couldn't get to things that were familiar and go to the end. I read every single word and didn't just read and then stop. I mean, even through those six chapters, to read out loud and stop and understand what you're reading. I would encourage you to do that between now and next Wednesday, that you read chapter 1. Even if you don't know the names, start voicing those names, and, and let's walk through that together. And I think it'll be a meaningful thing. Um, on Wednesdays, we will have a discussion guide in here every Wednesday. I didn't have one today because I knew it was just an overview. We'll have a discussion guide that you can um, work through together and then take home and follow up with um, every, every day I think, or each week. I think that seems to be a more effective way. Um, of walking through this. So if, will you read Matthew 1 before next time? And then I look forward to, to talking through that together. Um, let's close today by this video. Now, y'all, this is a video. We do this each time we start a new book. It's called The Bible Project, and they have a kind of quick summary of the books. Matthew's divided up into two because <laughs> there's so much there. So today we're only going to see the first one. It's Matthew through 1 through 13. I want to make a couple of comments on this, though, um, you'll hear them say things in there. There's one in there like, 
We don't know who wrote the book of Matthew. Traditionally, it was Matthew. So you'll hear that. And that's because across the board, although most Bible scholars think Matthew actually did write this book, there's some that think, well, I'm not so sure. So you'll hear that. And then another thing, when he talks about um, how people responded to Jesus in his day, there's, there's one section he says some folks were neutral about Jesus. And he mentions John the Baptist in there about being neutral about Jesus. Well, there's a reason he mentions John the Baptist about being neutral about Jesus. Immediately, you're probably thinking what I did. Well, wait a minute. John baptized Jesus. He said he's not worthy even to untie his sandals. Um, what do you mean? He, you know, he's, behold the Lamb of God. But do you remember later in John's life when he was imprisoned and he sent, a, he sent word to Jesus, are you the one we've been waiting for? And so there was, there was a, a, a season in John's life when he didn't understand, I believe, he didn't understand how things were happening the way that they were if Jesus was going to be the king of the Jews, why is it that this, this, there was not a mass army rising up to overtake the Romans at that time? And so he had some questions. Now, this video, the author kind of says, so that means that he was, he was neutral. I, I think um, there may, may have been, to me, I don't know if I would word it that way, but it's there, and I understand why he worded it that way. So I'll just I'll leave it there because you'll see that. I'm not alarmed by it, but I did want to point that out, that um, you know, this cousin of Jesus, who was the forerunner of Jesus, it mentions there was neutral, and I think it was because of this questioning that he had near the end of his life, are you the one? Because Jesus sent him the, man, the answer, quoting the scripture you know, from Isaiah, absolutely, I'm the one is what he was saying. I'm the one that, that was prophesied. So um, let's watch this video. I'm simply going to stand back up and close us in prayer right after this.